We have been looking now for last week and this week on the Christian's relationship to sin. In Romans chapter 7, the Christian's relationship to law. Now last week, I hopefully uh, showed you the rationale by which Paul develops his thought. Uh, Romans 6 is divided, I think, into two rhetorical questions, and these questions are geared towards supposed objectors. We call this diatribe. And Paul is going to answer, I'm sure, some of the things that people had said to him after he preached on this theme of justification by faith as a free gift of God through Christ. And there were several objections to this. And so Paul puts those objections into the form of a supposed questioner in uh, Romans 6, 1 and 6, 15. Now I want to try to open that question a little more. Last week I told you that basically that 1 through 14 is dealing with our freedom from the old nature, that we do not have to sin anymore, that Jesus has made inoperative that Adamic influence that forced us to rebel. Hallelujah. And now in verse 15, another related question comes. Now I want to show you what I'm doing so you can check what I'm doing to make sure I'm not leading you down some personal theology. God help me, I don't want to ever, ever do that. In verse 1, I want to remind you that it's a present tense verb. Are we to continue to ascend, to abide with sin, uh, to uh, continually embrace sin? And uh, that is very important to show that we're speaking of a manner of life. But in 15, there's a different question. Now, my Williams translation, which I use when I teach out of, and the Phillips translation of the Bible, both translate the sentence of verse 15 also as a present tense verb. Uh, shall we continue to go on sinning? Now, that is not a good translation. That is not what the grammar of this text says. This is an aorist tense verb that speaks of completed action, usually in the past. Now, King James is a much more accurate translation. NIV is a much more accurate translation. ASV, very good. Shall we sin? Now, it's not continue to sin. It's not the sin nature we're dealing with. We're dealing now with individual acts of sin. Now, I think all of us would agree uh, that after we're saved, we continue to sin. Now, I think we have made such a point of that that we don't see that although that may be the experience of mankind, Romans chapter 7, that there is no provision made in the mercy of God for God's children to be slave to sin or slave to sins. No, as we realized we were free from the mastery of sin over us, our old Adamic nature where we had no choice but to sin, I want to say to you, neither are we free to have time off for bad behavior. Neither is it appropriate for Christians to sin in isolated units. It's a very strong ideal. We feel very uncomfortable with it. But please, I want to be fair to Paul's thought. I will deal with the problem of sin in the life of the Christian that we all experience when I get to seven. But six is the ideal. Six is the power of God that has already delivered us from sin. We sin because we want to sin. Now, there's, there's the bottom line. So let's look again. What are we to conclude? I'm going to change my Williams. Shall we sin because we are not living as slaves to the law but as subjects to God's grace? In other words, shall we take advantage of the grace of God? Is it okay to sin a little bit, preacher? No. No, it's not. Sin is a problem in the life of the Christian. You may rationalize it, you may culturize it, you may deny it, but rebellion against the known will of God is a problem for the Christian. 
That's what we're going to talk about today. Now Paul ends this first question uh, with the same way he ended the last question in, in verse 1. And it's with this rare optative form. May genito. It's translated by King James, God forbid. It really means may this never happen under any circumstances. May we not misunderstand this problem of sin in our life. Verse 16. Do you not know that when you habitually offered yourselves to anyone for obedience to him, you are slaves to the one whom you are in the habit of obeying, whether it is slavery to sin, whose end is death, or obedience, whose end is right doing? Now what Paul is basically doing here is summing up a truth. Paul would say, I think, in rather stark, black and white, very contrasting terms, not dealing with the gray of our experience, but in very stark reality, he would say this. You serve one of two masters. You serve the evil one, and your life takes on the family characteristics of the evil one, which can be exemplified in the fruit of Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the world which is dissension and strife and lust and drunkenness and anger and envy and on and on, or your life is controlled and dominated by God and you take on the family characteristics of God, which is also the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Now, we will and do serve one of these two supernatural powers. And the one you know that you serve is the one that your life reflects. Verse 17. But thank God that though you... And look at your translation. You see the word were there? In English, we use this for something that happened in the past but is now changed, exactly how the Greek used it. Continual action in past time. You were slaves to sin. There were no question because of Adam. We looked at Romans 5, 12 and following. We were all slaves to sin. We're born slaves to sin. We sin because we're sinners. That's the way it was. We were slaves to sin. But now we have been freed to serve God. You see, I'm afraid what happens is that in the Christian life we say, Ah, I'm free from, from the devil's control, I'm free from sin. Now I can do what I want to do. Wrong. We are free from evil to serve God. May I say that again? We are free from evil to serve God. We are going to serve something besides ourselves. You may think you're serving yourself, but your life will take on the characteristics of one or two of the supernatural powers by which our world is penetrated and influenced. You were slaves of sin, but you became, or you are, aorist tense, completed, brand new state, brand new person. Uh, You were dead and now you're alive. Old man, new man. Old creature, new creature. Out of darkness into light. You are, you became obedient from your hearts to that form of teaching in which you have been instructed. Now, I have several things that motivate me when I preach. And that's always a problem because what that is is my presuppositions. And you hate for the Bible to be dominated by your presuppositions. First time I went through this, I think it's reflected in your notes, there's a part of me that is very evangelistic. A part of me believes that men are lost without Christ and that the mandate of God for his church is evangelism. And whenever I hear a a thing about responding to God, my mind automatically goes toward evangelism. Now, and and in my original notes, I put down, this this involved faith and repentance, and I listed all those verses, Mark 1, 15, Acts 3, 16, 19, Acts 20, 21, because that talked about trusting Christ. But the more I thought about this, the more I studied it, this is not talking about becoming a Christian. These folks are Christians. They became Christians back in chapter 4. If you follow the argument, they were saved by faith, right, to the work of Christ. These are believers Paul's writing to. This cannot be gospel message they received. Then what is it? It's got to be the teachings of Jesus about lifestyle. Now, my big fear, and you've heard me say it over and over, you say, how many times are you going to say that? A bunch. (laughs) Because I don't think we know it, and I think we're unbalanced. 
in our love for evangelicalism, in our desire to bring people to Christ, we have presented the gospel of Jesus in these terms. Only believe. Only believe. It's a free gift. Just come receive it, and your life will forever be God's. Now, there's a truth to that. And we all believe that salvation comes in an initial response to the wooing of God's Spirit and faith and repentance on our part. But I submit to you that there is a corollary as biblical, as mandated, as important as belief, and that is this. That not only is repentance and faith something we do to enter the Christian life, but repentance and faith is characteristic of all of the Christian life. We never get to the place we quit repenting and believing. Yes, it starts with a time, but it issues in a lifestyle. And what we're talking about now is the lifestyle of repentance and faith, the ethical teachings of Jesus and the apostles that were presented to these Roman Christians. We're not talking about becoming a Christian anymore. We're talking about now that you are a Christian, how shall we live? That's what we're talking about now. How shall we live? Let me continue a little further then. Verse 18. And since you have been freed from sin, this is that aorist passive participle, once and for all, by an outside agent, we have been freed. I, I thought to myself, I went home and Peggy said, how did it go last week? I said, honey, I think I hollered. <laughs> um, there are some things we ought to be hollering about. And I think the, that we are free from sin is a hallelujah subject. Amen? So um, I threatened this morning I could get no amens in the early service, this great truth. I'm going to hire three black deacons if you all don't start amening. I'm telling you. We'll bring them right here, similar the front row. I'm going to have some emotional support. So I believe that what we're talking about here is that we have been free from the power of sin in our old nature and we're also free from the dominance of sin in our life. And I, I think it's what this is talking about. Y'all see verse 7, y'all see verse 22. The same thing is said three times. We are free in Jesus Christ. Free from sin, and you have become slaves of right doing. You see, we're free, when you're free from rebelling against God, now you're free to serve God. Verse 19. I'm speaking in uh, familiar human terms. And what Paul is saying is, I wish I could give you a better analogy but I don't think all of you can understand, so I'm going to put it on the lowest shelf possible so that every one of the believers in Rome will not doubt what I'm doing. So I'm putting this theology in very familiar terms, but by doing that, there's going to be some misunderstanding. No analogy is perfect. No analogy can, be, can, uh, can hold at all points. So Paul said, I'm going to use a faulty analogy, but I'm using it so you can catch the gist of what I'm saying. Because of the frailty of your nature, for just as you formerly offered your, your parts of your bodies in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing lawlessness, so now you must once and for all offer them in slavery to right doing. You know, I think we need to hear this scripture again. I think modern American individualism has so influenced us that we think we have far more rights than we really do. The Bible puts it very succinctly when it says, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Glorify God in your bodies. Now, that is, that is a pretty strong statement. And I want to, that to say that, that is what's characterizing this. We were freed from sins to be alive to God. And we need to realize that we need to serve Him. Now, notice it says that this is what we do, look at verse, I'm in verse 19, which leads to consecration. This is the word sanctification. Now, in, in last week, I talked about that verses 1 through 14 pretty much teach what we call positional sanctification, that we are right, holy, just, uh, consecrated, we're saints. The moment we trust Jesus Christ, we are righteous because his righteousness is imputed to us. And that happens the moment we believe. But there is another element of sanctification. And this second half of Romans hits this other one. First is positional. This is possessional. This one is true because of who we are in Christ. This one is true because we are, we are encouraged to walk in him. And think of the number of times this happens in the Bible. 
to Christians, just take Ephesians, walk worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you. First John, walk in the light as he is in the light. I want to say to you that you can tell which um, person you serve by how your life is. Now, d deliver me from somebody who says, oh, I love Jesus, but their life reflects that in no way. Now, folks, I'm telling you the truth. You may play games with your mind. You may play games with your theology. You may play games with your church, but you are who you are, and you know who you are. Galatians 6 puts it so away, 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. And if we sow to the flesh, we will from the flesh reap corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Last week I asked you, who reigns? in your life. This week I ask you, what are you sowing in your life? The old little cliche is, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Good question. It continues, I think, very, very pointedly in verse 21 where it says, let's go to 20. For when you were slaves of sin... You were free so far as doing right was concerned. Serve the devil. Life is characterized by it. You had no temptation the other way. What fruit or benefit did you derive from doing the things of which you are now ashamed? None for the end in death. But now, since you have been freed from sin and have become slaves of God, the immediate result, the fruit, is consecration, sanctification. Holiness. I think we forgot that. Somehow in our enthusiasm to bring people to Christ, we forgot there are two messages. Whosoever will is a wonderful message. But the whosoever wills need to clean up their act once they are. And sanctification is something we have left out. We're, we are scared to death about people who preach sanctification or holiness as if we had the ability to to, to separate the two aspects of the Christian life. The Great Commission is very plain. It says, go into all the world and make disciples. There's your evangelism. There's the whosoever will. Then it comes right back and says, and teach them everything that I taught you. There's your sanctification. You say, well, Bob, what I want to do as a Baptist is cut those two in, right in two, put justification in my pocket, and get on with my life. I know you do, sucker, and it's bad. It's the reason the church is powerless. We're playing games with God. Sin is rampant in our life. We are rationalizing it, culturalizing it, explaining it away, and wondering what in the world's the problem. If I could put it in Old Testament terms, there's sin in the camp. You say, what are you talking about? I'm not about to name sins. Would that be dumb? I'm certainly not a don't spit, dance, and chew person. I guarantee you that. But the minute I start naming them, I'd leave you out and you'd take comfort in it. No, I'm not going to name them. No way. With the fruit of being freed from sin is that we become like Christ. There's the goal. Look at the second fruit. The final destiny is eternal life. There's the ultimate. We, I, I think I've shared with you, I used to be so afraid as a child because I really, I think I've always been a religious person. And I, was a fr I knew I wasn't doing all that God wanted me to do. I knew I was biting the things he said. I was afraid to stand before him. Well, I still respect him as the creator of the universe, but I want to tell you, I'm, I'm waiting for Daddy to come get me. I mean, I'm wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus, and when I stand before him, I'm going to stand on the promises of the Bible, and I know that I am completely holy in him. Now, he may ask me, what did you do and why? And that'll be okay. But I, I think we have to be recognized that the goal of Christianity is not heaven, it's Christ-likeness, and that thank goodness when we stand before, before him, there is no fear because I know who I am in Christ. Somebody once told me, great preaching is telling Christians what they already are in Christ. I believe that. I believe that. 
I'm so glad that this thing ends on verse 23 because it ends on a note of grace. Oh, hallelujah. We've been, we have been hammering. I've talked to one person and said, they said this morning to wear your steel-toed shoes to, to church. Well, folks, if talking about sin means you feel uncomfortable, I think we're probably doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Amen? Am I supposed to tap you on the back and say what a wonderful person you are when you kind of are a jerk? What we want is someone to say, oh, that doesn't matter. I have no problem with that. Just keep right on. There is a problem with it. There is a problem with it. Sin should not be in the life of the Christian. You say, easy for you to talk. Oh, really? Now, I'm not going to end this sermon on theology. I'm going to end this sermon today on some practical steps to deal with sin in your life. But I want to tell you, I'm thrilled death. this thing ends on the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, and I want to cover that right now. In this chapter 6, we have personified sin in at least two ways and probably a third right here. We have personified sin as a king that rules over the lives of its subjects and that in Adam we were all under sin. We have obviously spoken of sin as a slave master who owns slaves and controls their life. That's, that's obvious. We've used those two metaphors. Now, this word is used in the papyri of a general paying his troops. So there's a real possibility this is a, a military metaphor of a general in charge of, of soldiers and paying them. But I want you to know, whatever this, whether king or slave owner or general, the wages this sucker pays is death. But oh, thank God, that's not the end of this sentence. But the free gift of God. Now, boy, I can go up in holy smoke on the free gift of God. You think I enjoy talking about sin? Croak, no. Give me grace any day. But the problem is God's people are so lazy and so trusting in justification by faith and so clinging to once saved, always saved, they don't know there's a call to a standard of holiness. Yes, I love to preach the free gift of God. And I want to give you the verses where this is said in Romans and, and then again one other place in Ephesians. I, hope, I think they're in your notes. If they're not, please write them down. Chapter 3, verse 24. Chapter 5, verses 15, 16, and 17. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how much uh, more magnified Paul can say it than it's by grace you've been saved, through faith, that not of yourself, gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When I stand before Jesus, I am not about to say, I don't spit, dance, or chew, go with those who do, I, I didn't do this and this and this. I think we think the more things we don't do is what holiness is. I submit to you, the more you are like Christ in love is what holiness is. Not the abundance of things you don't do. Though there are some things we shouldn't do. Just <laughs> shouldn't do it. The Bible says it in the area of don'ts, then I think that'd be pretty good. Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Boy, what a wonderful way to end on grace because we're about to plunge back into the miseries of personal sin in chapter 7. But I want to end this sermon, and this is not in your notes, I just wrote it. <laughs> so, with six uh, thoughts, guidelines, helpful hints of how to deal with sin and temptation in the life of the Christian. If you don't need that, you're welcome to leave now. Number one, know who you are in Christ. The, the most wonderful thing in the world is to understand the gospel. Oh, oh, it frees you. It frees you. Know who you are in Christ. Know what Christ has done for you. Boy, that just, that just wonderfully, wonderfully gives you a freedom. I've, I've put in a parenthesis, you are free from sin. You are dead to sin. You are free from its mastery. You are dead to its influence. Who you are in Christ. Number one, mental. I know who I am. I know when I sin, I break daddy's heart. I know I'm right with God as a free gift. Therefore, number two, reckon your position in Christ into your daily life situations. Now, this deal about that you are dead and your life is hid with Christ, this idea that it is no longer I that live but Christ liveth in me, 
the thing that Steve read to you, one died, therefore all died. It's called in many names in theology, the deeper life movement, death to self. I think it gets a little radical some places, but it still is the truth. I don't care what the temptation, I am dead to sin and alive to God. And the more I can put that theology down to where the rubber meets the road of my daily life, the more I'm going to be free. Number three, we are not our own. We must serve God. We serve out of gratitude and love for the one who first loved us. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us. My little children, I'm writing that you may not sin, but if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I think we have to know that to be saved from sin is to be saved to serve. We obey God. We walk in that out of gratitude, not out of performance, out of gratitude, out of love for a God that loved us like that. Number four, the Christian life is a supernatural life. No one can live it in their own power. The Christian life, like salvation, is a gift from God. The Christian life, like salvation, begins in a response of repentance and faith, and it issues in an ongoing response of repentance and faith. There's going to be a beautiful uh, choral benediction today about peace, peace with God. May I say to you, peace only comes through repentance and May I say it again? Peace only comes through repentance. Your daddy loves you so much. He is not going to pat you on the head in the midst of your sin and say it's all right. He's going to whip you so that you can really find peace in his will. We don't need people having peace that haven't been convicted of sin. Put it crudely, there is some bad news before there is really good news. And the bad news is we can't live in sin. We don't have to. We shouldn't have to. We do it because we want to. It's not pleasing to God. You're going to lose the joy of your salvation. You're going to lose the peace that passes understanding. You're going to lose the assurance of heaven. You're going to lose your effective Christian service. You're going to lose the joy of worship. You are going to lose everything if you stay in known, unconfessed sin. It's exactly why the church is the way she is. Number five, don't play around with sin. Label it for what it is. Turn from it. Flee from it. Don't put yourself in the place of temptation. I, it amazes me. I can't believe some of the things I'm hearing on television again in the life of some of our preachers. If you have a pornography problem, don't thumb through Playboy, dummy. If you have a gambling problem, don't go pet the horses. If you got a greed problem, don't play the stock market. What is the matter with us? We want to get as close to the line as we can and show how in great control we are. First of all, admit that what you're doing is not a cultural thing. It's not a small thing. It's, not, it's a problem. It's a sin. Admit it. Label it. Know that if you do it, you do it because you choose to do it, not because you have to do it. And then keep yourself away from temptation. If you've got a problem with alcohol, for goodness sakes, don't go have a beer with a friend. Bingo! You are responsible to flee. You can't say, oh, God, help me, and I'm going to do everything I want to. No, you're responsible for how you handle it. Number six. I believe sin is an addiction that the church loves. It is an addiction. This, this chapter has, has, I think, clearly shown us that we sin because we want to, not because we have to. The power of sin can be broken in the Christian life. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes volition.